Hello, everyone. Uh, like Joseph, I'm from New Relic. Uh, I work specifically on the New Relic RPM gem. So if you've ever used New Relic's product and add us to your gem file, that's uh, some of my code that you're running. And a lot of what I'm going to talk about today comes out of real experiences that we've had in getting our test suites to be stable. Now, I bet most of you have had the experience where you're coding on a feature, you're writing up your stuff, you run all of the tests, you're a good good coder, good citizen, you do all that stuff locally, you push it up to the build machine, and the build goes red, right? The test broke. You're like, what? I ran the stuff, I know I ran this. And so you trigger the build to go again on the build box, and it goes green, and everything's happy, and it carries on. Like, this is not an inspiring sort of way for your tests to behave. This is not the sort of thing that you want. Um, so what we're going to talk about is a lot of the causes and things that go into that and ways to combat it. Um, if you're interested in following along, these slides are available online and they'll, uh, it should be posted later too. So what's the shape of what we're going to talk about? First off, we're going to look at the troubles. We're going to look at the things that cause your test to be flaky different spots that that comes in. There's two kind of primary causes that I found in this. One is state that leaks between your tests, and one is the way that you actually do comparisons. Certain comparisons are more prone to flakiness than others. Next up, we'll look at techniques. This is going to be split between ways that you can write your tests and write your code to completely avoid these issues. That's like the way that you really want this to be. You don't want these to crop up. But the truth is that they do, and so being able to have techniques for locating them as well is really important. And lastly, we'll look at a couple of very specific tools um, that myself and a couple of friends have developed to deal with really, you know, kind of pinpoint issues in this space, but just to kind of whet your appetite for the ways that you can automate locating and fixing these sorts of issues. Most of the examples that I'm going to show throughout this are going to be written in many tests. Now, this does not mean that these things don't apply to other testing frameworks. This just happens to be one that, for one, works with Ruby these days and is really basic and straightforward. So um, be prepared for that if you're more of a respect fan or test unit or whatever. But let's get into it. Let's talk about trouble. The reason that your tests very often will get um, out of whack and get into a flaky state is when there's data that carries over between your different test methods that you're not expecting. That sort of state is the worst possible thing for the stability of your test. Because your tests, in your test frameworks, like many tests, will not always run in the same order. And that state that leaks between your methods can cause things to not be in the same state when your test starts that between the different times that it runs. So let's look at the most obvious example of this. The most obvious sort of state that could be shared between different spots is a global, right? So none of us are bad programmers here, so we don't do this sort of thing. We don't have our globals. You know, we use design patterns instead, right, to, to deal with this. If you have globals, those can cause your test to fail. And this is kind of the, the most basic case that we can see of it. So let's say we had that evil global variable that we're holding on to. And we want to test that, you know, things aren't equal. So we refute that variable. That's all good. But, you know, we kind of need to test the opposite as well. So we've got another test in here that, you know, makes sure that we set it to evil and checks that the condition actually holds. So when these two tests run, when the first test runs, that value in evil is going to be false or nil, whatever state, and that, that's going to pass that assertion. And then when we modify it in the next test, that test is going to pass on. But what happens if we reverse the order? If we run these tests in the opposite order, we set that global state, and that sets it to true, and that persists to the next method. This is you know, the most basic thing about how this type of test leakage works. When that value gets to that second test, it's going to flake. You're going to have problems. Your test is going to fail, depending on what order it runs in. OK, so like I said, we're, we're all good programmers here, right? We all know that globals are terrible, so you know, we're not going to use those. But you know, there are other places that state can hide. So what about constants? You know, for one thing, in Ruby, like, you can redefine a constant. It will warn you, at least. But, you know, it will let you do that sort of thing. But it's even more subtle than that, potentially. So in this case, we've got you know, just a number that we're putting into that constant. But what if it was more of an object? What if it was a list? 
or some sort of uh, bigger data structure that we've got. Well, that doesn't necessarily go away. That constant persists between those times. And so if somebody does something that they shouldn't to the value that's being pointed to by that constant, you can get leakage between your tests, and guess what happens? <laughs> Place out depending on the order that you go. <clears throat> Class variables are another place that this sort of thing would, can reside. Now you might think because of the name, like they're class variables, right? It's nicely scoped, it's not global, it's, it's part of my class. Well, you've got one instance of your class in your application and it's a variable that's living on that class. It may as well be a global. So we set classy to true, we test that it's classy, everything's good. But if somebody wrote a test that modifies that class level variable sometime later, if the order of those two tests is reversed, you end up right back in the problem. So those are all kind of similar classes of things. Those are all places where kind of global state or something that's close to global state can hide. But there are more subtle ways that this can creep in. If you have eventing systems and callbacks that happen within your application, the registered event handlers, the blocks that you have, can potentially hold on to things across test runs that you might not be expecting. So in this case, this is using an active support notification which is a kind of event dispatch mechanism that's built into Rails, and we subscribe to a certain event. Now, if we do this more than once, we do this in our tests, that testing object gets held over. And any time that that event fires, you can potentially have multiple things running. This has happened to us on the agent that I run in because we've got a small eventing system, and at some point, we were getting some weird effects because running the code in one of those event blocks you know, mutated some state or did something that we weren't expecting or crashed. And when I looked, we had 50 different event subscriptions. There were 50 of these objects that were hanging around, and every time we would do something, they would get called in these tests because they were hiding in that event callback. Any place that that state goes into, that event dispatcher, because it's global, gives us the opportunity for us to end up with flakiness. All right, so Ruby is very famous as a dynamic language. That's a big part of its appeal. It's a big part of what's great about it is that you can do sort of metaprogramming, right? You can open up a class, you can define a new method, you can remove things from it, you can alias things. These sorts of modifications are also really ripe for having instability in your tests if things depend on the order. Once you've done this type of modification to a class, Unless you write the very specific code to unravel it and try to put it back to the state that it was before, that class is now modified for everybody that follows you. Now, you might be saying, okay, I, again, I'm a good programmer, right? I don't do all of that crazy metaprogramming shenanigans. I don't do anything that modifies sort of the global state by loading code. But I've got some bad news for you. When you require things, you're modifying that state. Depending on what libraries you use, you may not know what is getting modified by those calls. And the time that you require a particular file during your test run may modify the behavior of it after the fact if you've got things that depend on that functionality in some way. Especially if you're writing a library, um, if you optionally depend on the presence of another library, once you've loaded that code up, really hard to make it look like that code wasn't there for the remainder of your test run. And that can cause instability and flakiness depending on the sequence that things run in. So it's a really popular thing to talk about in, in Ruby these days, uh, threading and concurrency. But this is also a really, really good way to make your test extremely flaky. So in this case, this is the simplest possible example. We spin off a thread that just goes and modifies this global state. Right? And then we test that that's fine. But if we ever have a test that runs after this, that thread didn't terminate. It's not necessarily gone. So unless we control the lifetime of the threads that we're directly interacting with and make sure that those conditions hold, you can end up with all sorts of flakiness. And threading is really something that's difficult to get right and difficult to test in an isolated way within your test suite. And there's a lot of other places that this sort of thing can happen too that I'm not going to address quite as directly, but might be supported by a framework. Databases is a big one. Like if you've got records that you generate during the course of your integration, you <laughs> end up modifying state there. Those often you'll wrap in a transaction, and your fixtures will have some way of resetting that between test runs. But you know, 
What about queues? Do you put background jobs somewhere or record some other sort of transient state in the <coughs> cache? What about files? Are there files on the disk that you read during the course of your operation that might change the behavior depending on when those happen? What sort of other external services do you hit directly? All of these things can potentially accumulate state that, be, depending on the order, will cause your tests to be flaky. But state is not the only place the trouble can creep in. There's a couple of other very specific cases <coughs> around comparisons that I've seen that makes it hard to write tests that are reliable, depending <coughs> on the values that come through. Probably the, the most basic candidate for this is floating points. So, we have a basic assertion here. We're asserting that 28 is equal to 0.28 times 100. So, what do you think happens when we run this test? Anybody? Fails. Fails. Right. Floating point math is not like the math that we learned in school. It's not exactly like you think in your head. And if, if you've been programming for a length of time, you've probably run into this. You know, there's pretty easy ways to work around it. You can assert that things are within a certain delta. But depending where those calculations happen during the course of your logic, like imagine if this is some sort of business system and this is buried in some object that it ends up generating this field and we want to check it. Like, knowing where you need to be careful about those values in the range of them can be difficult at times. A related problem to this is time. So time, often talk, is represented by floating point numbers, or by numbers since the default. And so if you write this test, which looks totally simple, right? You take the time, we convert it to a floating point number, we reconstitute it into a time value, and turn that back into a float. You run this on Rubinius, this will occasionally fail, depending on the time of this. So any time that you're dealing with time values and translating them through this sort of round tripping, you need to be aware that there's potentially edges that are not going to compare exactly. And so writing your test comparisons so that they are more specific about what you actually need to assert. Does it matter that it's all the way exactly matching that floating point, or is there some delta, or is there some more expressive way maybe to check what time that is that you're actually meaning to say. If you write any sort of code that does timing, now this is near and dear to my heart working for New Relic, we do performance <coughs> monitoring software, but the goal of what we're doing is to time how long something takes. That's a really hard thing to write a non-flaky unit test for. Make, knowing what the time is that things are supposed to be. If you don't take some uh, pretty strong measures about controlling how the underlying system is reckoning time, you can end up with a lot of flakiness when things don't compare the way that you're expecting them to. There are lots of other hazards in the day and time or in that. <laughs> uh, but, uh, from the chuckles in the room, this definitely resonates, right? Time zones. I've had issues at prior employers where we had, you know, all of our stuff had been running in Pacific. We were all on the West Coast. We were all on the West Coast. Then we acquire some place in Indiana. And we run a call center out there. And the difference in time zones made it so that our tests didn't run properly. And depending on where it was going, we ran into failures. But it gets even more subtle than that. Because every programmer's favorite thing, daylight savings. There's two times a year that if you assume that there are 24 hours in a day, you're wrong. And if your test runs during that period of time and is doing some sort of date math and calculation, it can potentially be incorrect. And depending on what sort of software you're writing, that difference might actually matter. If you're scheduling an appointment out across daylight savings time, are you sure that that's getting scheduled to the time that you actually need it to be? Lastly, I've also seen problems with time of the, the overnight test failure, right? The test that, you know, if it runs between 11 and 12, sometimes it just doesn't work right, because we got some off by one in how we're doing our time comparison. And maybe you just let it go, because it's like, yeah, it's the middle of the night, whatever, it just runs, it, it clears itself. Right up until that time that you've got a bug, and everybody's all hands on deck, and you're fixing the issue, and you're ready to deploy at 11.15, and then this middle of the night bug becomes a very present time bug for you. All right. So that's a lot of really depressing ways that your test can be flaky. That's a whole pile of trouble and problems. Let's look at some techniques that can help you to avoid these sorts of things. So if you can write your test to avoid 
flakiness to begin with, you're going to be in the best possible place. And most of that is around controlling your objects, controlling the scope of everything that's going into your test. You know, finely grained, focused unit tests are going to give you the best bang for the buck and avoid flakiness. So if you can make it so that your objects are pure instances, and the only things that they depend on are data that you pass into them or that are created with them, and then they go out of scope when your test is finished, you're going to be good. As long as the testing class here doesn't do anything weird, doesn't touch any global state, doesn't reach out to any classes, spin up threads, if all that it's doing is just simple calculation, then this test is going to be stable and isn't going to have the potential for flakiness. But, you know, this isn't always realistic, right? We, we live in a real world where, unfortunately, you have to interact with other parts of your system occasionally. Or maybe you come into a test, uh, into a code base that has an existing test suite and has existing code that may not have been written with this in mind, and that you can't really change how all of those relationships work in a different way. Well, in those cases, what I recommend is finding a way to reset consistently. So this is a method that we have in the code base that I work on because we have exactly this problem. There's a large pile of our legacy code that doesn't maintain its borders quite right. We've got a lot of singletons that want to talk to each other. And so what we've done in the meantime, while we work on rooting those things out, is we've made one place that defines how you reset state between tests. And then this means that any time that we find some leakage, we find that, oh, the error collector on the agent really should have been reset after our tests and we weren't doing that properly. We can codify that in one spot. And then each of our tests can simply say, hey, provide me with the functionality to make sure that I'm in a clean state. And everybody benefits from having the same playing field to start from in their tests. Now, this is a stopgap measure. It would be nice for us to get to a point where the system can not have to rely on that and we can make clean instances. But until then, this at least lets us maintain uh, the code and keep a handle on what's going on. So one of the big issues we talked about was time. Um, fortunately, in Ruby, time is actually fairly easy for us to manipulate. There's a, a very common gem uh, called Time Cop, and that allows you to freeze, advance, and then mess with time. So basically set the time that you think things are happening at. And with this capability, you can write your tests to be specific about when they're executing. So you can have a particular piece of code advance time by a certain amount if you're looking to time duration and be confident in comparing the value that you've advanced by. You can set time to particular points in time that matter. If you care about things going across daylight savings time or going to different time zones that you need to check, you can set the world up in that state and not just rely on, eh, whatever time the tests are running is the time that I'm going to be counting. So time cop is a great way, if you're doing any sort of data time calculations, to take control of the time and not just rely on time now and whatever value it happens to be when you're running your tests. This has actually also made it into the most recent version of Rails. So 4.1 introduced a couple of uh, helpers as well that are very similar in spirit to what time cop does. So you can say travel to this particular date, and for the duration of that block, the date will be set to what we could ask for it to be. Um, so it's really nice that this stuff is kind of making its way in. If you're working on Rails and on the most recent version, then you may not even need an external gem. In the Ruby agent that I work on, though, we don't take a lot of external dependencies. But fortunately, Ruby comes to our rescue. So we do have some mocking and stubbing. And this is actually almost the entirety of our support for making sure that we can handle time appropriately. We can freeze time at a particular point, and all that means is for us to stub out time now so it returns what we expect it to. We can call advance, which just modifies the value, moves it forward by whatever increment. So for us, if we want to test that something times a particular block of code correctly, we can use these to freeze time before it executes, advance time during the execution, and then check the result that comes out the other end. It's really pretty straightforward for you to do. Another issue that we talked about earlier was metaprogramming. So if you have code, in this case we've got a transmogrifier class, and you pass that a class and it's going to make some mutation to that. Maybe it adds some methods, maybe it aliases some things. Well, you know, if we defined a class in our system 
and then run this code against it. That class, it's got modified, right? And if we want to run more than one test, it sort of muddies the state, and things potentially could have flakiness from that ordering. But Ruby's dynamic nature yet again comes to our rescue, because a class is just an object. So on the first line there in the test, we just generate a new anonymous class. And that class only exists for the lifetime of this test. We can modify it and meta program it in whatever ways we find appropriate. We can derive it from whatever we need to. And then as soon as the test is done, that class just disappears. So I've moved a lot towards doing this sort of mentality for testing metaprogramming methods versus having like a test class that we put in there. Um, just because it provides so much benefit in being able to be sure about the lifetime of when that code has gotten modified. But sometimes, you know, you can't always just generate a new class quite like this when you're doing metaprogramming. You know, if you're working against other libraries, and maybe you're modifying those other libraries or extending them, you may need to test in the actual presence of those libraries and make sure that things go well. And for that, there's a couple of different gems. Um, Thoughtbot's appraisals and uh, Sensor Chipmunk's test beds. And both of these have uh, a little different spin on the same idea, which is letting you define different sets of gems and then run your tests in the context of those gems. Now you can set that up so that um, you get a clean slate, right? If you need to test against two different versions of things, you'll have a clean run the next time that you go through it to be able to, uh, to check that. This is really valuable if you write a library that depends uh, on other libraries and cares about the versions. So like if you've got, for instance, extensions to Rails that you're writing and you want it to work across, you know, everything from 2.0 to 4.1, well, you need some way to test all those combinations. And these gems do a pretty good job. We actually have some stuff uh, custom coded in the Ruby agents that I work on because we had some also uh, some specific needs. And if you want to look at that code and see what we did for it, it might give you some insights as well into how you can break your test suite up and have small pieces of it that are able to run in a context that's different and has different code loaded and available um, than the main process. So that's a lot of ways to avoid having flaky tests. The reality is it's probably going to happen at some point. You can't completely avoid these problems if you're writing things um, from, you know, well, you might be able to, but you're a better programmer than I if you can completely avoid all of, all of the flakiness that's out there. So let's talk about how you find those things and eradicate them once they happen. So the first thing to be aware of is that you can get the ordering of your tests. And for the sort of state-based stuff that I was talking about to begin with, where if things go in a certain order, um, they'll fail, it's really important to be able to see what that order is. And just about every test framework that's out there is going to give you a verbose mode. So in this case, because we're calling it through Rails, I, have to, I set an environment variable with minus b as the option. If this was just a Ruby execution that I was doing, I would do minus b after the files. And then that will tell many tests to go spit out all of the files at, or all of the individual <coughs> tests as it runs them. So this is really important for figuring out that order because if you can't see what order it's going in, you can't start figuring out where that state is leaking. When I'm on the track of something like this, a lot of times I'll put a lot of logging in. This is really basic, seems kind of silly, but it's often the best way to kind of get a handle on what's going on if you've got mysterious sort of state and you're not sure where things are creeping in and when stuff's happening. Um, my little tip here is those are my initials and that helps me to make sure that I don't accidentally check this in because that kind of stands out when I'm reviewing it in the code so you don't accidentally leave logging in. It looks like it belongs there but it doesn't. Another trick in the logging as well is that sometimes I know a particular piece of code is getting called but I don't know how we even got there. Like for us in the Ruby agent, we spin up a background thread. Most of the time in our tests, we don't want that background thread to get started up. So if it gets started, it's kind of surprising. And I need to know how I arrived there. By simply putting a caller and I format it with the join, we put new lines and print that out, I can figure out exactly where a particular piece of code is getting picked from. This will pr present a stack trace for you and point right to how you ended up with the code that you weren't expecting to call without having to debug in. So we talked earlier about listing all of the tests that things run. There's also an idea 
in many tests and I think in our spec, of providing a seed that dictates the order that things go in. So many tests will randomize how things run, but that's not very helpful if you have an order dependency that you need to track down. Once you've found the sequence that's bad, you want to be able to rerun that bad sequence. And that's what the seed lets you do. You give it the same number, it will run the files and test methods in the exact same order that it ran them before. So you can repeat that until you figure out what the problem is. So in our indication, it would look like this. And that list of tests that it's running there, that will be the exact same sequence every time we give it that seed. There's also things built into many tests around the order of the methods within a given class. And uh, if you can't tell what Ryan Davis thinks about order-dependent tests, well, this method might, uh, might give you a little bit of insight into how he feels about it. But if for some reason you've got a test that you need to run those methods in the same order, there is a way for you to force it to do that. Now, order dependencies are not necessarily the only type of failure that we end up with, though. Sometimes, you know, even when you run things with the same seed, even in the same sequence, some particular call is just going to flake out for reasons that are external. Very often this happens with threading tests, because the state of the system is based on where the threads are executing, not just your tests. Um, but these can be really, really hard to figure out at times because it's not that grand sequence of the test runs. It's, you know, it just happens every so often. So one way that I come combat that is just force it. So lovely the mini test is just Ruby. So I can call setup and tear down, just like mini test does for me, and run this particular method as many times as I want. So if this one method being run in isolation eventually fails, this is a good way to force it and give me more time to run it without having to run my entire test suite over and over again waiting to try to find it. So similarly, there are times when running the whole test suite seems to be part of the problem, right? It, it's, you may not know exactly what's going on, and for that, I do a similar thing, but just out at the shell level. All things are true, go execute my test, and the or break means that as soon as I get a failing status code out of my tests, this will stop. Now, this works really well with logging, if you've added logging and to give you additional information, because maybe that logging doesn't tell you much during the normal runs, right? Maybe the normal sequence of events looks like what you expect it to be, and that doesn't tell you anything. But that logging will be present, and then this will let you stop once you finally get that failing case. And then you can examine the sequence of what went on and try to figure out what the problem is. So, We've also run into plenty of issues before with just plain differences that exist in a build environment from your local environment. And these are really bad when this happens, but you know, the paths and directories that things are in, the exact gem versions that you're running. Um, if you have anything that depends on time, the performance of that other hardware might actually matter. You know, Ruby covers over most of the operating system differences, but every once in a while something actually is different between you know, running stuff on Linux and running things on a Mac, um, particularly around some of the threading and mutex sort of contention issues. So sometimes you just got to go run it on the build system where it is, and those are some things to think about looking at. So let's talk a little bit about one of the other big cases that can cause your test instability, and that's threading. So if we have a thread worker class here, all that this does when we call go is it spins up another thread and that thread goes and does some sort of work. And we can imagine that maybe this is some sort of loop that processes something or some sort of long running action that we care about. If we suspect that we're getting some sort of bad interaction in our test where things are failing because of instances of these threads getting spun up, sometimes it helps to put a sleep in. Now this is not for fixing your tests. You don't put the sleep in and then the test passes and so yay, everything's fine. But the sleeps can be really useful for changing the timing. It's kind of like a stick that you can poke at it with and make things behave and go in a different sequence than it does before. It's sort of a blunt tool, but sometimes you know, you're at your wit's end with these sorts of threading issues and anything that you can change about the order that things are going in can yield you interesting information about what's happening. Similar to what we saw with the looping, um, just repeating things or pounding it with a lot more threads can oftentimes also show these sorts of issues up, especially if you've got deadlocks or race conditions. 
If it's something you can spin up more instances of, just hammer it and things will happen more quickly. The last tip that I have as well is that if you are writing threaded code, and this is really hard to do properly in any sort of complicated environment, but you want your test to be able to have control over those threads, over the sequence of what's going on. And one of the best ways that I've found, as rudimentary as it is, is to simply allow your classes to expose the thread that is doing the work. And then your tests can be written to interact with that thread and make sure that what's happening is what you want. So in this case, we spin up our worker, we tell it to go, and then in the test we join on it. So that makes sure that that thread is actually done, ready to go away, before we're done with our test. Now, if that work was a loop, Maybe we need a way that we're going to signal to tell that to you know, finish itself out and exit the loop. It gets more complicated the more sophisticated your system is. But having your test be able to control those threads is critical for keeping the stability in your system. All right, so that's a bunch of techniques. That's a bunch of things that you can use to approach avoiding and locating these sorts of problems. Let's look at a couple of tools, a couple of very specific things for some of these cases. Now, all of these things I've actually got up in a repo with some basic examples for the three tools that I'm going to introduce. Um, and then the repos themselves have some interesting stuff in them so you can see what's going on. The first test is called Test Bisect. And this comes from a coworker of mine at New Relic. And what this was useful for is that we were having issues where the sequence of tests that we would run would cause a failure. And it was really hard in a very large code base to figure out what was causing that failure and to sort of bisect down to what the minimal set of tests that we needed to run that would cause the problem to occur. So you use test bisect by including it in your gem file, generating a task for it, and then this will allow us to run a bisect on the list of tests that we're doing. So if we imagine that we have a test like this. And let's say we've got a whole bunch of these. We've got several. They kind of all are around this global or awesome condition. But when we run, we see that when we get down to test number six, we get a failure. Right? Well, we look at test number six. It doesn't look like it's doing anything uncontroversial. As a matter of fact, it's exactly the same as test number one. Maybe there's some deduplication we could do. But, you know, for purposes here, there's nothing between test one and test six that we can see in just this examination that tells us why it fails. So what we can do is we can run test bisect, which you can see on the first line there, the indication. We tell it the file that had the failure. And then what it will do is it will take the list of files that existed before that in, in it, run those and the, tests, the file that we're looking for the failure. So it sort of takes that set of tests that ran before it, cuts them in half. And it sees, oh, when I run one and two, six passes. So that's clearly not part of the set. Then it'll turn around and bisect keeps turning. And it will run the other half of that list. And it sees, ah, oh, when we run three through five, we get a failure on six. And it will keep chopping the list of files down until it finds the minimal set that will tell you that test number five happens to be the one that's causing our failure here. And if we look in test number five, we'll see that you know, it's pretty obvious in this case what the failure was. But test bisect allowed us to kind of winnow down to that very quickly. So this is kind of fun tool. The only uh, caveat at this point is that it's only for test unit. I'm planning to figure out how to do this for mini tests, but uh, for the moment, that's where that's at. So the next tool is a gem that I wrote called Hometown. So Hometown, you install it into your, uh, in your gem file, and then you ask it to watch particular classes. And what it's going to do is it's going to watch any time that objects of that type are instantiated and save a backtrace so that you can see where that individual object came from. And this is really helpful like uh, in cases of like, threads that get spun up in the background or things that you create as part of your processing, as part of your program that you may not expect to have happen. So we've had background threads get spun up in our test suite. This will tell me where they actually got started from. So what it would look like if we imagine we have a test here. It starts up a new thread. And then in our, in our actual test, we just iterate through the threads. And we ask each of them, we ask hometown, hey, what's the hometown for this thread? And what that returns to us is a trace object 
that has a back trace of exactly where that instantiation happened. So this has been useful both for threading cases where we had background threads being spun up, and also we had a case where um, the we have kind of a global configuration object, a singleton floating around. And one of the tests was replacing that config with a different instance. It was like wiping it out and putting another one in place. Now, once I figured out that that was happening, I could have just grabbed the code and found it. But since I didn't understand what was going on, I was able to kind of look at the objects and I say, hey, where did this config come from? And I noticed that it was not the place that it should have gotten instantiated. And that led me down the path of finding what was different between those tests, and what was different in the sequence. Okay. So, Awesome. All right, so the last gem is kind of similar in spirit to Hometown as well, um, but it is specifically a mini test plugin. And this is called Mini Test Stately. Install it in your gem file just like usual, and then provide a configuration block. And you can say, hey, watch this condition. You give it a name, that's for the reporting. And what it's going to do is the block that you give it, it will run that before and after each of the tests that execute, and then it will prepare a report for you what tests that value changed during. So in this case, we're looking at the thread count. So if there is ever a test that causes the thread count to increase during its execution, then we'll get a report at the end that says, hey, this test made this particular thread count, made the thread count rise. You can make those conditions be whatever you want them to be. So here we're running it in the test example that I have, and then the thread count clearly test defined is generating a new thread, and test again is also generating another thread. So this would let you set kind of pre and post conditions around your tests for checking what's going on, and making sure that state that might be leaking isn't. Stately also provides a couple of other nice little bits. It has a run, which doesn't do any comparisons, but will execute after every one of your tests. And so if you know that you've got state, like that consistent reset I was advising, you could plug that into something like this. And then people don't have to remember to clear that state. You force it to be clear at the same time. Might be better to write your code so that that's not necessary, but you know, if you can't get there from here, this is a good way to apply that across the board. Similarly, there's a fail if, which this does, a condition check, and if the value that gets returned from this is truthy, it will actually fail that test run. So if at some point you don't want, you know, we should never have more than 10 threads. That means something ran away. or you know, this state should never get here. This will fail you right at the point on the test that had that happen. Now, there's one caveat to this, and that is that this requires many test five. And in Rails world, that means I think at least 4.1, I'm not sure 4.0 supports many test five, um, which is a little unfortunate, but as time goes on, I think more people will be able to take advantage of this. Many test five has an awesome plugin system for writing these sorts of things. So, we've talked about a lot of stuff, covered a lot of code, we've talked about the troubles that you get from state and ordering, the problems that can come in from having comparisons that are not as precise as you need them to be. Talked about how to avoid test flakiness to begin with and how to locate it when it happens. We've looked at a couple of tools that you can use to dig into that and find the problems. That's what I have today. Thank you. Yes, that's a Puma 5 and you can on a pile of rubies. We've got about six or seven minutes for Q&A if you want right. to. Anyone have questions? I'd, I'd like to hear if anybody's uh, got tools that are not in Ruby that do some of the same stuff. Not this one. I don't. <laughs> I think we might have drawn part of the Ruby crowd here. But I know, I mean, I know I definitely have encountered this sort of problem, like, I did .NET and C Sharp at a prior job, and we had exactly the same problems. I mean, I think the general issues are across languages. The techniques and libraries you use are just a little more specific. Yes. What do you recommend? Can you talk a little bit about uh, storing state in a database? Like, what do you recommend? Like, like that? So, to be totally honest, I work on a library that doesn't have a lot of database backing for it. So, I I kind of purposefully didn't put recommendation in because I didn't feel like I had a strong opinion. Um, yeah, so 
I don't know. I, I don't know if anyone else has strong opinions or, or good experience with that about you know what database switching techniques. I know I've seen ones that use transactions, and that's been in prior gigs has been kind of my go-to, but it wasn't in Ruby and Rails space. So I'm not sure if that makes the best sense there. All right. So if it's a problem that tests modify classes and cycle variables and start threads. Mm -hmm. Why not just run each individual test in its own process and just control the process at the end? Um, so the question is why not just run things more isolated, run individual tests and processes in the video? Um, I mean the biggest thing for me would just be the, the overhead of that. You know, we have test suites that are thousands of tests long and we run on JRuby which takes 30 seconds to spin up for a test and doesn't have four. Um, there are definitely things that you can do like that. Um, I think some of the, like the multiverse and the, some of those other test suite approaches um, might take some of those tactics for kind of dealing with some of the speed issues. But for us at least, it would just be too heavyweight to try to spin every test off individually. But it would certainly get you the isolation. I mean, if you if it's a small enough set or that's something that's workable, with like it's great to be able to just completely box the thing off and not have to care what happens after that. And the ultimate reset. It's also a possibility that if you isolate all your tests to that degree, you will be hiding legitimate bugs. Yeah, good point. Any other questions? Thank you.